bless your life. Uh, this moment, we're going to invite all the little ones and the kids to go to kids ministry with Pastor Sarah. Pastor Sarah, she said today, this morning, she said, I wish I had this lesson when I was a kid in kids ministry. So today is going to be a good day for them. Always is, but Pastor Sarah is fired up for this morning. Amen. Church, as you guys know, we are in a progress um, of our transition place, and we're trying to build this custom leading up to that moment um, for us to go ahead and pray over. Would you just um, close your eyes with me so we can pray over our building? Heavenly Father, as a church right now, we are united before you, God. And the Bible declares what two or three here at earth, Lord, agrees on something. It, it will be binded up. It will be connected and given by heaven. And as your church right now, Lord, we come to establish, God, in agreement and prayer that we pray for this place which you are taking us over there, Lord, at 6890 West Atlantic Boulevard, Lord, that you will make a flow happen in that place, that your holy move will come to that place, Lord, that that place will be a beacon of light to those that are in need of salvation, to need, Lord, to restore uh, uh, their lives, God. And we ask you, Lord, to pave the way. Pave the way, Lord, into the permitting. Pave the way, Lord, into the licensing, Lord. Pave the way, Lord, into the, the construction, Lord, the aspect of, of renovation, Lord. Pave the way in the financial spectrum, too, Lord. We are asking you, God, to make a way because we believe that this is your kingdom. This is for your glory, Lord. And we're asking as a church, knowing in agreement, Lord, that the, the gates of hell will not triumph over your church, God, in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. So, church, we are speaking on our series called Naked and Unafraid. Now, this is our series finale. Aw, right? Aw. I don't know to some of you, but the Lord has been speaking very, very strong in our hearts in very specific different areas on how we can be vulnerable, but at the same time, we can be unafraid. And, the, and this whole entire aspect of this, um, of this series was to bring in us the mindset that, hey, we can open up. It's okay for us to be vulnerable. Right. And in the first week, we started to speak on the aspect of King David. It all started with King David. You guys remember he was dancing in the street when he was bringing the ark of God. And Mikhail, uh, his wife, was in the window and she was watching and she was giving a big no, no. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. As it is custom, the wives were giving a big no, no, you know, and she was calling his attention. Hey, you shouldn't expose yourself like that. But David was having a hard time, but saying, wait a minute, I was exposing myself before the Lord. And so we talked about having this ability that in life we're going to be given opportunity to expose ourselves and live the moment in the streets. Or are we going to live by the bystanders of the windows telling us how should we live our lives? Second week, we spoke about abandoning what? smallness, right? How there's so many little things inside of us that rules our lives. And God doesn't want us to live that way. And many times we feel that the gospel of God is actually what? Breaking down on us. It feel like it's jailing us. And all of a sudden we feel that we're being enslaved. Wait a minute. I didn't sign up for this, pastor. That's how he's, I didn't sign up for this. What is this going on? But the Bible is telling, hey, wait a minute. This imprisonment that you're feeling is not actually from God. It actually comes from within you. The pettiness, the, the feeling of smallness is coming from inside of you because the Bible says who the Son sets free is free indeed. So you have to grab hold of that freedom. Amen. And then we spoke about that on, on, on the third week. We spoke about that no matter what you do in life, there's going to be people criticizing you and you have to overcome criticism you have to 
Go ahead, be naked and unafraid, no matter what people are going to tell you. At the end, only Jesus was over there hanging at the cross. None of his disciples, none of the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the one that pushing him there. So at the end, if you're going to get crucified, you might as well do it. Go over, run over the criticism, overcome the criticism that they throw at you. And last week, we spoke about owning your story. That is up to you to own your story, to know yourself, and not to play the, the blame game. Not to say, it's your fault that I'm like this, but actually taking responsibility for what life gives to you. And we brought up the greatest famous quote that is inspirational, and some people even believe that is in the Bible. When life gives you lemon, make lemonade. Amen. So, and today we're going to be speaking about um, living a future when you're naked and unafraid. Now, we started speaking about um, David, and I'm going to uh, read a passage here. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Actually, I'm going to be reading um, quite, I'm going to be skipping verses because I feel I didn't want everybody to do their Bible reading, you know, all at once at church. It's going to be quite long, but come with me. Early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd, loaded up, and set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle position, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistine were drawing up their line, facing each other. Dave, David left his things with the keeper of supplies and ran to the battle lines and asked his brother how they were. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his line and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw the men, they all fled from him in great fear. Now the Israelite had been saying, Do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. David asked the man that was standing near him, what will be done for the man that kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Same chapter, verse 28. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the man, he burned with anger at him and asked, <clears throat> Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave uh, those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Same chapter, verse 38 through 40. And it speaks like this. Then Saul, uh, then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put the coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul. Because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand. Chose five smooth stones from the stream. Put them in the pouch of his shepherd bag. And his sling in his hand approached the Philistine. Verse 45. David said to the Philistine. You come against me with sword and spear and javelin. But I come against you in the name of of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, who you defied, who you defied. Amen. Wow, right? That was very uh, uh, precise. And we see, we see a, a very beautiful thing happening here. It's because in the story of David, this is the story that puts David in the spotlight. This here is by far the greatest story that we teach in, in, in biblical stories uh, to little kids. And if you grew up in church, 
You grew up believing that your God was a God that does what? That made you a giant slayer. That made you kill giants. And you would leave looking for giants because you're saying, oh, my God can give. And all of a sudden, nobody knows why, but all of a sudden when you see kids in church in parking lots throwing rocks and rocks entering the, uh, um, the windows of cars, and then the parents like, why did you do that for? I'm sorry. The blame is on the church. We were teaching them that throw rocks and you kill giants. <laughs> and so they were throwing it and hit a window, okay? But this is a story that is fantastic because in this story here, we can clearly see everything of what we've been speaking on. This story here is literally everything that we've been speaking on. So David was a little shepherd boy. He was taking care of his father's sheep. It wasn't even his sheep. It was his father's sheep. And to tell you the truth, now all his other brothers were into battle. And to go to battle in those days, it was something heroic. It was something good. It was something that would promote you in society. Now to be a shepherd... I don't know about that. I mean, somebody had to do it, right? Somebody had to do it. And it was basically you would attend the flocks. And it's not like his father had a humongous type of flock where he had servants to be managing. Hey, you, you take care of the flocks. Hey, you, I, I, we need to cut the wool away from the flocks. No, no. He was the one looking at his father's little flock. That's all he was doing with his life. Taking care of his father's little flock. And his father goes and tells him like this. Hey, here's some food. Go and take it to your brothers that is at war. So he leaves. He goes on this road trip. And when he goes to the road trip, what is funny is this. Is because when he arrived at the battlefield, they were suiting up for war. And here we see something that David all of a sudden saw that. Wow, war is coming. And whenever war is coming, what do you have a tendency to do? I remember when I was uh, in high school and the September 11 incident happened. And then they were saying, get ready, we're going to go to war. And all of a sudden, me and my friends, we started to freak out because, uh, uh, no, when we were going to the Iraq war, then came uh, Afghanistan, and then came the Iraq War after with Bush, and we were starting to freak out. We were like, oh, no, we're going to go to war, and what's going to happen? And a, a bunch of people started to say, oh, no, they're going to enlist us. It's for sure. No, it's for sure. We are all afraid of war. And it's funny that many of us, if we say we're going to go to war right now, deep, deep down inside of us, we wouldn't want to go because we wouldn't want to be putting ourselves in what? In danger, in risk. We wouldn't be putting ourselves in certain situations that we knew would be life-threatening to us. Now, the funny thing about David is this. David saw war as an opportunity. As an opportunity to escape his life. That he was living it. The opportunity to go ahead and be doing what his brothers were doing. To not be interacting so forth with the sheep. Because when he arrived, they were lining up for war. And David was so smart that he said like this, I need to leave everything. He didn't stay behind. He didn't say, you know, let this incident play out. Let this incident play out. Let, let it play out. Let's see how it happens. And after this, I will go to my brothers. No, no, no. He saw, here's an opportunity, and I must take a risk. He said, what if I go in the middle of the battle? If I drop everything here and go to the battle, go where my brothers are at and say, hey, guys, how are you doing? And all of a sudden, the war comes upon us. Then I'm going to be right there in the middle of the battle. And then I'm going to, I can't back down, and I'm going to be able to fight with them. That's what I'm looking for. And see, we see two things happening here. We see David Looking at the possibility of risk, risk taken, and also abandoning the thing that was limiting him. And you know what was limiting him? The food. The food was limiting him. The food was limiting him to do exactly what God was calling him to do or to be able to fulfill his great destiny inside of him. So David 
Seize the risk, said, I want to live in a risk, and abandon the smallness, which is the food, and say, all right, let's go right into the middle. And in the middle of the battle, he takes a chance, and all of a sudden, he's hearing the great propaganda that people are doing. Nothing like marketing mouth to give, like, word of mouth. Nothing like marketing, especially when you're selling that you're giving freebies away. And we're not just talking freebie. We're talking like winning the lotto. Because this guy is going around, yo, did you see what, what's, man, this guy, every single time Goliath comes down, I mean, we back down this wimp, and, and even the king is getting tired of the situation, and the king is saying, we need to do something about this. How about we give some, some type of, uh, uh, of things away to rewards to make the people see if they will build up the courage and the faith. Let's give money. Let's give money. Okay. Lots and lots of money. Everybody moves money, but you know what? There, what's good any money if you're dead? That's what people think. Uh, what's good any money if you're dead? And if that wasn't the case and it didn't promote people, the king said, you know what? Just money is not suffice. How about this? I will give my daughter in marriage. I will make you a prince. I will make you a prince. You're going to be a prince. Whoever goes and fights and kills this guy, you will be a prince. To see him motivate people. So now you have money and you got status. You got social status, right? And the heart of people still wasn't fulfilled. People were still afraid. And you have to understand this. How Goliath was massively scary. Think about this. What would you do if I say you can be a king uh, 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 inserted into the royal family over uh, uh, overnight, just like that, you say, what's the catch? What do I got to do? What do I got to do? You got to kill a giant. That is a killing machine. That is a champion that's been living his whole entire life only to train to kill. You know, money is good. Being inserted into the family is good. But what's good? If I'm dead, you know what? I'll stick with, with any other woman that comes in my life, any other relationship that comes in my life. I don't have to be that. I don't know. It's too much, it's too much burden to be a prince anyway, <laughs> they started to say. And you know what? The king finally said something that would motivate people in such a profound way. He said, all right, you guys are not motivated enough. Whoever, whoever does this, you're able to get money, be inserted into the family, and you will no longer have to pay taxes. Mm. So basically, you're going to get money, you're going to have status quo, and you'll be able to keep all your money without having to give anything back. My goodness. My goodness. And not only you. Your whole entire family would never have to pay taxes. And this was like for David, like, man, this is too good to be true. He's hearing it and he's asking, yo, 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 you know when you hear something is so good and, and, and like it didn't click on you. You understood what the person said, but you are trying to figure out if what they said is actually true. And that's what happened with David. He was hearing this, and he wasn't believing. And he kept on asking, can you repeat again? What will the king do to the man that goes and take this disgrace of this giant away from Israel? And he said, all of this stuff. And David gets excited for this. And he starts to speak in such a way that he is saying, you know what? I, I, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to go ahead and be able to kill this giant. Now, the minute he starts to speak this way, what happens? His brother hears him speak. And his brother starts to pound him. And you can see how brutal and vicious the attack is. Because his brother starts saying, what are you doing? His brothers are saying, what are you doing? I know how wicked you are. 
I know how evil intent in your heart you are. You abandoned all those little sheep so you could come here. And little did he know that he was just following his father's order. It's literally like that. Sometimes you're just going to be following the father's order. The heavenly father order for us to do a task. And people will come and say what? Mm -mm -mm. You're evil. You're doing everything wrong. And once again, David had to access risk taking. Yeah, I'm going to go to war. I'm going to change my life. He abandoned the small, the things that were limiting him. These foods. Okay, I'm going to start being an Uber driver and go in there to see if I can be something else. And then all of a sudden he faced harsh criticism. And in the midst of the harsh criticism, he's able to deflect what his brothers are saying to him. And he ignores what they're saying and he keeps on talking to the people that are giving the propaganda what the king will do. In such a way that the people hear it and said, oh, oh we, have, we have a courage in the midst of Israel. Let's go tell the king. So he goes and tells King Saul. King Saul hears about this. And said, finally, whew, I thought I was going to have to face. <laughs> have you ever been relieved for something? Have you ever like, you know that things are about to fall. The, the scale of the whole entire world is about to fall on you. You know, that's the thing about like everyone wants to be a leader and stuff like this. Until the moment that if no one else do it, the leader has to do it. You know that type of thing if you're a business owner. Like the employees can all go with a sick day, but you still have to show up and open the door or, and open the door of your business, makes the call, makes the payments. King Saul was saying, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to face this guy. I don't know what else to give. I don't know what else to give. And all of a sudden, here comes the boldness. Here comes the courageousness of David. And gets to the king's ear. And the king said, this is my man. Come here. What do you need? Here you go. And, and you have to understand this. Back then, the person that was most protective, just like how it is today, was the king. Was the representative of state. If you see how much our government spends in national security for the president alone, it is ridiculous. But it's not that it's ridiculous. It's because he needs protection. And so the king's armor at that time was the best armor you could get. It was considered to be the most resistant. Uh, uh, the weight was less than the others. And it was made to he be flexible and protective and at the same time go to war. And then the king says, here David. Use my stuff. And all of a sudden, King David put it on. And he's moving on it. And he sees that he loses a lot of momentum, a lot of flexibility, a lot of agility on it. And he's able to assess his own life. And he's able to say, you know what? This, this is not who I am. This is not who I am. This here is not for me. Because who I actually am is out of all of this stuff gone in the sling and some rocks. And you can see that David is taking ownership of his life. You can see that he's not trying to live what someone else is putting before him to live. And you can see not only does he play the blame games and says, you know what, King David... Uh, King Saul, uh, this stuff is too heavy for me, man. I don't think I have a chance to face him. No. He said, listen. I came like this and I'm going to go to war like this. And at that moment, we see that King David goes to war technically what? Naked. He goes, he goes to war naked. Oh, church. He goes with a sling. 
Pastor, that's not being naked. He went, are you kidding me? A sling considering the spear of Goliath that weighted around 70 pounds of spear. Think about that. His shield was two-thirds of my weight. Just a shield. Can you imagine a rock before a shield that weighed that long? And his sword alone, he went literally naked. And you know, in life, we feel that, God, I don't know, I don't know why, like, we want to run away from battles. And the idea is this, in, in Psalms 144.1, it speaks like this, Praise be to the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war, in my fingers for battle. <laughs> when we're trying to escape the reality of war, God is training us for war. And it's funny how to put David in the spotlight, to put David to grab hold of his future, there had to be a giant, there had to be a war. In our, in our days, of course, our wars are a little bit different. We're not looking for physical giants around. I mean, the minimum that you can see is Shaq. <laughs> that's, that's about it. But Shaq is not out there trying to murder people and go to war with people. No. But nowadays, we see that there are still giants in our lives. There is giants of, of, of our eternity. The giants of our vices, the giants of uh, our, our marriages, the giants of so many things that are coming up. And it's funny that we don't want to be facing giants. That's the truth. But it's funny that God is trying to train your hands for war and your fingers for the battle. And you're saying, what are you training my hands for, God? I, I don't want this. Because we would rather purchase God's service. Woo, that's strong. We would rather purchase God's service for Him to do the battle. Here, God, be my hitman. And God is saying, no, how about I train you and you go to war? And this is a, this is a, a spiritual maturity that as Christian, we will face certain things in life. But that does not mean that we have to back out of those things. That we are going to face certain giants in life. But that does not mean that we are going to tremble before them. That does not mean that we got to back away. There was once somebody that said, that said this, that your greatest threat is not the size of your giant, but your perception of his size. Let me repeat again. The greatest threat is not the size of your giant. But your perception of his size. And David goes to the battlefield. And when he goes to the battlefield. Goliath starts giving a little smirk to him. Some trash talking, as we put it. <laughs> What's going on with this? Are you serious? Am I a dog? That you guys are coming to me against, against sticks and stones? Sticks and stones shall break my bones, but really? That's not going to happen to me, not today. Oh boy, I'm going to shred you to peace. I'm going to tear you up. David, I'm going to kill you. And David looks at him like this. David didn't see this humongous tall giant. The perception of David. He wasn't looking at the size of the giant. But he was looking at the size of his God before his giant. He said, this is nothing. And he said, listen, yo Goliath, I have something to tell you. Get ready. Here I am naked but guess what i am unafraid by today by tonight by the end of the day 
the birds of the sky will be feeding on your flesh. And the jackals and the coyotes of the desert will come and be licking your blood off because I'm going to kill you in the name of the Lord. I don't come against you with rocks. I come naked and unafraid. But let me tell you something. Just because I am naked does not mean that I am alone. Just because I am naked does not mean that I am powerless. Well, I am naked. But let me tell you something. I have God inside of me, so I'm able to be naked. But that makes me unafraid. And so get ready. I come against you in the name of the Lord. And everybody knows he starts to swing that little rock. And that little rock goes hit him in the head. He falls over. And then he goes and grabs his own sword. Goliath's own sword that was intended to kill David. David grabs his sword and kills Goliath. The thing that the enemy intended to be the chaos in your life. God made it the spotlight to put you in the future which he destined you to put to be in. And Psalms 3, 4 speaks like this. But you, Lord, are a shield around me. My glory, the one who lifts my head high. You, God. I might be naked, but I have God inside of me. And the idea for us to be able to walk in our lives naked and unafraid is because we have God as our shield. And therefore, we need not to be embarrassed about our own faults because we're not trying to expose, we're not trying to propagate ourselves, but instead, we're allowing the God of glory to flow through us. And He's the one that lifts our heads up high. Today, church, what are some things that life is throwing at you? Some giants that life is throwing at you. That you are having to overcome. What is your decision? Is your decision going to be, nah, this is not for me. I'm pretty sure that by now, in the first week, you're able to see that, you know what, maybe I, the Lord is taking me to new risk, new adventures, new ventures of life. Pray more, start in the healing, start fasting, start a new business, start a new product line. Maybe there's some things the Lord has been pushing you. And then... I know that for a fact that there were some things that were limiting you in your spiritual life and your journey with God. There was so many little pettiness and smallness and bitterness inside of you that you let that go. And then you finally had the chance to see all the people that would be criticizing the things that you were doing. And you said, you know what? I'm going to make a difference anyway. And you probably saw your mistakes finally for totally being yours. And you took ownership of them. And you took ownership of your life. And here you are naked. And the Lord is pushing you towards a giant. For you to seize the opportunity to allow the glory of God to be magnified through your life. You know, when we speak giants, we speak in so many levels. As a pastor, because I talk to my sheep, I know a little bit about your giants. But one thing I can tell you this is that I wish that you would have the same boldness and courage that David had. 
to be able to go to battle naked, not relying on your power, not relying on your strength, not relying on your abilities, but totally dependent in God. That's what about being naked is all about. This is the greatest revelation. Naked is about total dismiss of self. That you wouldn't even think and count on your intelligence to do such thing. That you wouldn't even count to think that you can do it out of your own merit. But you completely diminish yourself. Dilapidate your ego in such a way that allows only to be an escape. And that escape comes from God and God only. And when you're able to manage that, when you're able to let go of that self in such a profound way, only then you're able to be unafraid. In the same Psalms, Psalms 3, 4, they call it the Psalms of sleep. You want to know why? Because right after this verse, I forgot to put it here. Right after this verse, it speaks like this. I lay down my head and I fall asleep because you sustain me, Lord. We're only able to truly find rest. The minute that we completely diminish ourselves and allow that every single move from here on out will be on the basis on the merit of God in our lives. And I can finally rest. Because even sleeping, even at my most vulnerable, when David was saying, I can lay down and sleep, that was the most vulnerable moment in war. I remember if you had your babies, one thing is for sure, it's always crazy when you go to sleep, right, and, and you have a newborn with you. Because anything can what? Happen. And you're completely vulnerable. David said one thing, even when I'm completely vulnerable, even when I'm totally naked, you still sustain me. Face your giants. Don't run away from them. Go to war with them. God has given you, trained your fingers for wars and your hands for battles. Pray. If necessary, fast to kill that giant. If necessary, call the pastor. Say, pastor, we need a prayer chain. Pastor, let's do this. I'm always up for a nice little one week liquids only fasting. Let's go. Win the war through the Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this series, God. We want to thank you for the way it's been speaking to us in, in such a pro profound depth of, of our lives. Of also the way that we interact with the world. That in our Christian lives, that there is the sense of spirituality. But there's also, Lord, this thing that you didn't take us away from the world. And so we have to interact with the world, God. And we want to thank you, God, for, for acknowledging this, these areas of our lives and speaking to us, Holy Spirit, in, in such a depth. The things that we needed to, to adapt, the things that we needed to change, and the things that we need to let go. We earnestly come to you today saying, forgive us if, 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 if we are wimps, if we are lacking courage, God, to face our giants uh, full of you. Because we don't want to be exposed. We want to go face our giants with machine guns and bazookas. Not naked. Because we're afraid, God. Because we haven't yet reached this level of intimacy with you. We haven't yet reached this level of a relationship with you, Lord, in such a profound way that we completely trust you. And we admit 
that maybe we have trust issues. We have trust issues with you, God. But we want to, we're here today because, because we're trying to be better. We're trying to be holier each day, God. We're trying to make a difference each new day. So God, we ask you to come and look not at our lack of faith. But God, inspire us to believe more. Inspire us to see you work in a miracle. To see you making a way. To see you, Lord, shining where the darkness is at. Don't allow us, Lord, to run away from battles that you trained us our whole entire life for us to face. Don't allow us, Lord. Oh, God, push us. We ask you to push us in such a way toward these battles that we face them. That we will give the glory to you, Lord. That we will know. That before you and you only, that we can stand naked and unafraid. We earnestly ask you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, church. Hallelujah. Woo. This message has been so profound to us. Thank you, Jesus. Every time a, a, se a, a, a series is over, I feel like, oh, man. So. But then I get happy. You want to know why? Because the word of God is renewing every single day. And that means there's more. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen, church. This is the moment here at Holy Move Church that we, are, uh, uh, that we worship the Lord through our uh, tithes and our giving. In the word of God in Malachi 3.10 says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much bless blessing that there will be not enough room to store it. Amen. Hallelujah. Here at Holy Move Church, there's two ways you can give. You can either give to the buckets here. Or you can give through our apps. But before you give, as it is custom in our church, I want to bless you before you give. Because we believe that that is the way that the biblical principle of offerings and givings, it is done before the Lord. So hold up your envelope. Or if you're giving online, hold your hands like this. Heavenly Father, at this moment in the authority invested in my life, I come and I bless your children's tithes and their offering, God. I bless their financial life as they are coming before you, Lord, being faithful, giving the 10%, Lord, of their income, of their resources that you have given them, Lord. At this moment, God, I sanctify their offerings and I sanctify, Lord, of their tithes. Lord, at this moment, I come and ask you to pour a blessing upon their financial life. Make ways, Lord, where where it is needed, Lord. Take your children out of debt, Lord. Allow them to win any outcome in an outstanding debt, Lord. Lord, I also ask that you open up new ways for them to be prospered in their finances. Give them, Lord, investments. Give them properties, Lord. Show them the way, God. I also ask you, God, to go ahead and right now, Lord, rebuke the financials attack in their finances done through the enemy. Through the enemy called the devourer, the migrator, and the cutter over their life. And I bless them with abundancy in the name of the Lord. Amen. Let us worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings. Hallelujah. Yeah.
Jesus, Lord. Amen, church. Let us sing up. Let us praise the Lord. Let us finish worshiping Him. And a thousand generations, and your family, and your children, and their children, and their children. You see the blessing of the Lord. Be a party, and a thousand generations, and your family, and your children, and their children, and their children. Be upon you and a thousand Hallelujah. generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you over Before you go, I want to bless your life. The one hand in your heart, the other one takes like a little cup, like your mother of sea. And the authority invested in my life as your spiritual authority. I want to bless you. I bless your spirit that this week you may have a relationship with the Lord. That this week you may believe in the Lord so profoundly that you may be more able to walk in faith. That you may be able to walk vulnerable and unafraid in the Lord. That you may be able to read your Bible, do your prayers. That you may be able to fast. I bless your soul. That all spirit of sadness and depression will flee away from you. And that all your emotions will be intact in Christ Jesus. And that the glory of the Lord will be your strength. I bless your body. That the Lord will renew yourselves in the cellular level. That he will give you the right health. May he protect you from any viruses and any disease. I bless you. I bless your family. I bless your marriage. I bless your children. I bless your job. I bless your business. I bless your profession. I bless your studies. I bless your vision. And I bless your dreams. I bless everything that you do and everything that you touch for the Lord. I bless you in the name of the Father. I bless you in the name of the Son. And I bless you in the name of the Holy Spirit. May the love of the Heavenly Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the communion of the Holy Spirit be forever with you in the name of the Lord. Amen and amen. Amen, church. God bless you guys. Love you guys. See you guys next week.